Wow, okay, good afternoon. Um, I think this is relatively self-explanatory. I'm hoping this is easy. I mean, I'm, it makes sense to me, but I'm, I'm, I'm judging my, my performance yesterday, it's a bit of a stretch to expect it to make any sense to anyone else. Um, so, uh, and as I said yesterday, I'm kind of slightly repeating myself for understandable reasons. This is an attempt to um, merge, if you like, some theoretical speculation with some practical possibilities. Uh, I'm the theoretical speculation, and Tim is the practical possibilities. That, that's what we agreed, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, my concern has been, I suppose, um, a view that um, implicitly the open community and OER are, uh, I don't know, tacitly or implicitly, I don't know, globally northern or uh, Eurocentric. Um, and was there a, possibly a way of addressing that? Um, and I suppose... My thinking is then that actually what underpins um, pedagogy is culture in some way or another. Um, and when we try and use, if you like, OER, that I'm kind of assuming it's a default position. It's unprovable, but it's a default position. If I'm assuming that the OER are somehow tainted with a specific culture, and I'm then thinking about how can we make OER more relevant or more appropriate or more applicable to other cultures, I then say, ah, okay, so I can talk about cultures being different, but can I then kind of quantify or objectify their, the distance between them? Can I, cali can I, as it were, calibrate them so that I can say, I don't know, Chinese culture is in some ways similar to culture in Saudi Arabia, therefore what fits in there in Saudi Arabia will fit in uh, China or not, okay? Do I have a way of calibrating culture that would make that kind of measurement and that kind of inference possible? And if you like, just as a kind of um, modernist, something for the sake of argument, um, I pick on Hofstede quite a lot as a way of provoking my thinking about it or just provoking everyone else. Um, and, and he says, yes, you can, as it were, calibrate culture. Um, and there's lots of critiques of Hofst Hofstetter. I mean, not one of them, of course, being it's modernist and cute and not much else. Um, another being that level of granularity is national. So, you know, you could argue we ought to be looking regional or uh, um, any other finer gradations. And you could argue that we're all at the intersection of various cultures, which might be uh, our institutional and professional culture and our uh, ethnic and spiritual culture culture and whatever else, not just our national culture. But nevertheless, he says if you choose that level of granularity and that way of looking at things, then in his uh, empirical work, he says you can identify several different axes uh, or several different dimensions of culture. For example, is the country you're looking at highly individualistic and hi or highly collectivist or somewhere in the middle? You know, and so the Classic one is, well, the, you know, the United States of America is way over there in terms of individualism and, I don't know, maybe um, uh, People's Republic of China is way over there in terms of collectivism or, or communalism, as it were. Um, is there a great deal of difference between the highest in the society or the highest in the country and the lowest? Is it very hierarchic or is it very flat, and again, I'm sure one can think of kind of classical examples of at either extreme. I, you know, I imagine maybe Holland or Sweden are way over there, um, and so on and so on. Um, so, uh, well, sorry, and uh, low or high uncertainty avoidance. Is it risk taking or is it risk avoiding, risk averse? Um, does it have a uh, long term orientation or short term orientation? Does that drive people's values? Um, and I suppose part of my argument would be if you thought about specific teaching techniques like, I don't know, project-based learning, group-based learning, game-based learning, um, uh, and rather than assuming they're kind of unconditionally benign, do they have some kind of resonance or dissonance with any of these particular um, dimensions? You know, and so, uh, so I've encountered the problems in maybe in parts of Southern Africa where... Um, individualized um, competitive group based uh, individual and competitive work is problematic in collectivist cultures um, you know for example uh, and so and sorry there are various versions of this um, so this is one putting actual real 
definite countries on um, some of the axes, and, and probably the, the decoding is commonsensical, like Italy, France, Belgium, uh, Great Britain, and so on. And, and so you could argue that, um, or what I'm trying to argue, is that um, an OER developed in, uh, it says Great Britain there, I don't know why, uh, but I mean, you, well, <laughs> do I mean even the United Kingdom? The, the, well, anyway, where we live. Um, is no great distance in terms of these dimensions from the USA or Australia or Canada or New Zealand, and therefore it's no great stretch to see um, OERs developed in one as being relevant in any of those others. But on the other hand, it's a big stretch to Turkey, Mexico, um, and whatever it is, Guatemala, uh, you know, way over there. Um, so that's the kind of basis of my argument. Um, there are other models. It's not just Hofstetter and his um, uh, disciples. And so this is a different set of dimensions, if you like, that put the countries of the world on, um, what would you call this, triangular axis of uh, active, linear, reactive, and so on. The advantage of Hofstetter, you'll be pleased to know, is there's an app for it. Um, so maybe that, that's why it would win this game, that you, you just put the appropriate country in and you get the numbers. And so, um, and this is another one from Hall, looking at low and high context cultures. Uh, I'll skip that and skip that. And, and so our proposal was the idea that uh, OER metadata should not only include all the things it currently includes, but some indication of culture, for example, the, um, that the appropriate numbers from Hofstede's six or seven axes, so that then one could talk about its transferability from its country of origin, where you know the the um, OER, uh, sorry, the, the Hofstede numbers, to somewhere else where you can look up the Hofstede numbers. And on that note, Jim. thank you, John. So much for my half of the talk. Um, <laughs> Briefly, very briefly, to tell you that the context of this is an Erasmus Plus program using, um, using MOOCs to help refugees and migrants with their linguistic skills and entrepreneurship skills for social inclusion and employment. And um, we're at the stage of the project where we're developing language MOOCs and meta MOOCs to, uh, to help with this uh, project. And the way we actually started to do this, from previous experience, we've found trying to recycle old courses for this isn't necessarily effective for, cult for cultural uh, reasons. So we actually got together 20 refugee support groups in Madrid a couple of times. These are NGOs, uh, support networks, etc. And we actually asked them how do they carry out their, um, their training. And um, from this, we were able to do... Um, identify roughly almost 100 specific, um, what we believe are refugee-specific learning criteria, which we're able to classify into, into four categories. And then we actually started to think, okay, if we've got this, then how can we actually use it to uh, actually specify the, 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 the dimensions of the course we're actually going to uh, um, give to them? And then without going into any de detail, because I don't have an awful lot of uh, time here from the technological um, aspects, then we really need to uh, focus on mobile deployment because without exception all of them have uh, mobile devices. This is the main computational apparatus. For the linguistic factors, it's actually very sim it's important the, the sub-languages we use are, are simple and that we subtitle appropriately. So in the case of our refugees, they need to be subtitled in French and, and Arabic from a methodological uh, perspective, then it's very important the role of proxies in the facilitation process. Because obviously if we're typically white European males, then we might be pushing people out of their comfort zones, depending on the audience and the way we actually uh, uh, run the courses. So it's actually quite important to actually get the refugee support groups to actually participate in this project. And we are really, really happy and really, really grateful for the work they've actually done in this area. Because they've actually helped generate the content and they help helped facilitating and I think this is a really good uh, collaboration. And uh, as John was mentioning before, the important things here is also some of the, uh, the, the cultural factors because it's quite a heavy oral learning tradition. So we need to try and uh, incorporate a lot of this, try and keep the amount of text textual artifacts to a, to a minimum and um, think about the way these courses um, can actually be run. So um, the question there is, um, are we actually in a position to be thinking about producing a refugee metadata profile? Is it worth the effort? 
because to some extent you might think, well, if we have to adapt these courses just for refugees, I mean, I didn't mention that the courses aren't just for refugees, they're for migrants and anybody who are wanting to get an A1 uh, level of Spanish related to, to daily life. In, in part, the reason we're doing this is to, is to try and achieve some kind of implicit social inclusion, because if in the MOOC they're mixing with other kinds of uh, social groups, then hopefully that will facilitate social contact, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, we need a, we need a, a way of representing this information, so at least we can log what we're doing and think about how we use it in the future. But then what should we actually do with that? If we do have this metadata standard, what are we going to do? Because the platform we're basically using is our in-house install installation of, um, of open edX. I mean, what are we going to do? Are we going to hack the platform so that the, the course can be adaptively given to people? I mean, if we're giving this same course to refugees and migrants, can we just give the same course to everybody? Will it be equally popular? Because another one of the cultural aspects are that the people that are appearing in the video are culturally diverse and reflect all the different uh, ethnic groups. Will that have problems with our typical uh, white European audiences for the course? So there's lots of uh, research questions there in the, in the future. And we really are doing, focusing a bit in this area on this, on this cost-benefit analysis of, of what we can actually do with this, uh, this uh, representation of information and how we should use it in the future, moving forward to new kinds of uh, courses we might want to, to run with our, with our social group. I think with that, I'm just about on time. Thank you. Oh, John. Seamless. <laughs> Your turn to answer the question today. Yeah? Um, there is uh, time for questions, so does anyone have any questions after the presentation? Yes. Oh, sorry, right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, my interest was actually just in raising the question, maybe rather than, rather than thinking there was an answer, um, or that there was a practical answer. I don't know if there is a practical answer, and it, it clearly requires a lot of work, and I, I guess I pointed at some of the, I don't know, if you like, theoretical reservations. I mean, I suppose if I, if I had an objective in this talk or this discussion, it was about just uh, sensitising people to the fact that, them, that OER may be culturally specific and we can't assume that they're universal and if anyone else wants to go away and think about m moving to a next step uh, that would be great i mean i don't know what it is i'm certainly not advocating hofstetter cute though i think all of those pictures and diagrams are um uh, and, and yes uh, 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 and we shouldn't be giving the impression that refugees are kind of culturally homogenous. They're no more culturally homogenous than the rest of us uh, mm. but it would at least kind of challenge the assumption oh we can get the infrastructure right, we can put a platform up, and it won't be a problem after that. Um, so, you know, if we get any further than that, fabulous. I mean, it, it is very quickly, right, it is very difficult to answer and to actually think about how you might actually specify, you know, an application profile, etc. How will that be eaten by the platform? It's difficult because, I mean, I found it interesting, uh, David Wiley's comments this morning about learning objects, and I burnt my fingers badly making all these lovely learning objects in front of projects which no one actually bothered to reuse again. And I don't want to get down this... Uh, this uh, dead end again. So, I mean, how can we actually do this? Yeah. I suppose there is, a, is a, a slightly more general reservation, and that's actually in relation to refugees, we might succeed in making something that was more culturally appropriate to them, and yet actually not close the distance between them and the European environment which they're trying to enter. Mm. So, so it, it's not straightforward that it, it has to work for them if it doesn't actually help them understand the cultural environment in, into which they're moving. Right. Sorry, I've only just thought about that, so I better retract everything I've yeah, previously said. Yeah, Well, you could argue that actually, I mean, sorry. Curriculum or like curriculum or other countries yeah, 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 yeah. That, I mean, you could uh, you could argue that introdu even introducing the, these ideas to the to refugees or, if you like, non Europeans, would make them critically aware of the cultural divide or the cultural distance that they might have to traverse, rather than necessarily putting the onus on as it, uh, us, as it were, as the educationalist, to say that you know you're going to struggle with this for these reasons. Hofstetter, one, two, three, four, and five. That, that sounds like a kind of advert for critical digital literacy, I suppose, but no <laughs> harm in that. Okay, we have time for one more question. Just 
strikes me, I think maybe John, you put your finger on it, perhaps the answer is the, is to put our cards on the table when we do this kind of stuff and say, look, this is where we're coming from. This, this is our approach. Metadata has a role, but I don't know if this is it. Yeah, oh, oh, maybe so. I mean, yes, I, 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 my argument would be slightly flawed if in getting all of this culture incorporated into metadata, it then turns out metadata is uh, unhelpful and unused. Uh, <laughs> that will be kind of moving the deck chairs around on the Titanic, really. Learning is a messy and contingent activity. Yes. As, as it is. Well, and, and a kind of modernist flaw might be to imagine that culture is somehow fixed and, you know, to reify culture into something that is actually fixed and stable and measurable. So, again, that, yeah. But maybe, but, well, you might argue that's just academic. And you, I'd say you have to be, be careful because there's more or less formal aspects of metadata. I mean, metadata is just data about data. So you know, I wouldn't be wanting to suggest using LOM necessarily for this. I mean, you could use XAPI or something else. But I think it's very important to have a, an explicit semantic representation of how you set stuff up. Because if you haven't, then you can't tweak the variables for the next edition of the course and you lose sight of uh, things. Perhaps a, a way of expressing that And I'm going to ask you to park that until after the session, just because I don't want to run out of time for everyone else. But thank you both very much.